It's my great pleasure to introduce someone who has worked hard, diligently, every Tuesday, Thursday, Wednesday, Friday, Monday, whatever day she gets out of her job, she's in Waitley, and we are thrilled to have her. Can I tell the story of how you got here? Sure. <laughs> I think John was with you. You were yes. driving down, coming from your daughter's, down through Waitley, and I'm out walking, and she stopped on the side of the road, and I said, Jack, what are you doing? She said, you just moved back from me, and I said, well, come on over, and she's never left. So we are really <laughs> thrilled to have her. She's a wonderful architect. She's going to give you a story tonight that I look forward to a great deal. Usually, we have somebody that's going to talk, and they say, "Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure." You know, she say, "I'm so excited! I can't wait!" <laughs> so we're going to enjoy this. I'm thrilled to have Derricka Smith, who was a West Waitley teenager, I was and she left. <laughs> She left us and came back. Well, I'm happy to see so many people. I mean, we were a little worried because of the weather. But um, a shout out to my three sisters who are here and my husband. All the way from Vermont. Two of them came from Vermont. Yep. We're happy wow. about that. So I've worked on this a while. This is just a nice picture of a lot of soldiers recreating. And I think the interesting thing about it is that despite the fact that they were in the South, they virtually never took off these wool coats. They left them on the whole time. Now I'm going to talk. I'm going to start talking about the 31st Regiment, even though it's not the earliest number in Whiteley. But there's a new book that's just been published that's a very detailed history of the 31st Regiment and what they went through, at least in the beginning, was sort of typical. So I'm going to talk about that. Uh, that the early Early enlistees were always mustered into a local camp, and the camp that the that the 31st went into was in Pittsfield, and it was called Camp Seward. And they were they were uh, housed in the fairgrounds in Pittsfield. They were housed in the agricultural buildings, which were not designed for winter use, and they had no bunks. They just had to lie on the floor and uh, keep warm as best they could. But they did eventually build bunks. They were there for several months, so bunks were built, and they also came uh, in December. They got their uniform. This is the 31st. These are the people from uh, Whateley who were in the 31st. Lucia Salas, Slender Bardwell, and Gordon Johnson, not counting because his wife was from Whateley. This is the standard uniform, obviously not a real person, but they got the cap, the sack coat, it was called, the backpack, or the knapsack, the canteen, the blue pants, often with a stripe, and that was the uh, thing. So the, the recruits spent those early months drilling, and the, the kind of drilling that they did wasn't really useful for the battlefield, but it, it, it taught them how to work together, it gave them something to do, and it taught them to endure boredom, which was a lot of what being in the army was about, maybe always, or at that time for sure. They, they stayed in Pittsfield from September until February. They were then taken to Boston by train, and this was actually a very exciting thing because at every stop they were cheered, they were given food, they were given flowers, they were given candy. Everybody was thrilled to see them go and it was all very exciting. And so they went to Boston, and then when they got to Boston, they were put on a ship. This is the Mississippi, the ship that they somehow or other, a company was 100 people and a regiment was 1,000. And I, I simply can't believe that they could get 1,000 men, even though they almost never actually filled a regiment. But the ideal was 1,000, and the ideal for a company was 100. And we're, our guys were all in Company C. This trip, when they, this is where they were going, and this is now a national park. It's called Ship Island, Mississippi. This trip was absolutely cursed. They, they, first of all, they had very rough seas. They had never, most of them had never been on a ship, certainly never on the ocean. They became violently ill. They were, as you can imagine, throwing up all over the place. They had such a terrible storm, they were driven northward. Then they ran aground. In order to get off this shoal, they tried throwing off this, that, and the other thing. 
including a lot of their food, and finally they took all the all of the passengers off the boat, at which which was a laborious process. They finally got the ship off. They put everybody back on. The ship was damaged. They had to they had to go and fix it. They ended up in a plantation near Hilton Head, which fortunately had been deserted except for the slaves who were still there. So they were able to get some fresh food. But it took them, all in all, 33 days to get from Boston to Ship Island. So at that point, they were thrilled, right? This is wonderful. We're not on this ship anymore. But this island has, is covered with loose sand. And they, they had a terrible time drilling. And they also had a terrible time because the sand got into everything. It got into their food, it got into their clothes, it got into their coffee. It, it, was, it was just a nightmare. But the good thing was that the people were starting to die. Soldiers were starting to die, mainly be, partly because um, they, were, they were rural boys. They weren't used to being in crowded conditions. And so they were catching that chronic diarrhea was a terrific problem, and typhoid fever was a problem. But it was very easy to bury soldiers on this island because the sand was so loose that you could dig a drain easily. One of the interesting little things I read in this book, though, was that the, the regimental surgeon went insane, and they suggested that he starved himself to death, but in any case, he died. They shipped him back to Massachusetts in a whiskey barrel, which I assume was full of whiskey, but I, 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 I'm all assuming that. I guess it was a preservative. So the, what they were doing there was that they were going to, to overcome, to, to vanquish the two forts that guarded the mouth of the Mississippi River. Those forts were called, um, no, I've forgotten, Fort St. Philip. It doesn't matter in any case. They, they succeeded in doing that. They then <coughs> sailed up the Mississippi to New Orleans, and they had a battle of New Orleans and, and were able to, to win and occupy New Orleans. The 31st actually didn't participate in the battle. They were held in reserve, and, and so they, they didn't fight which was very disappointing to them, of course, because they were anxious to get into it. But the, the, the good part about it was that they were, as I said, they had battled nothing except lice. And so their uniforms were still clean. They were, they were bright and shiny compared to the other regiments. And so they were the ones who were chosen to walk first or to march first through the city when they occupied it. Leave the light on while I read this. This is Sumner Bardwell's letter that he, we only have a part of it, and I'm only reading you a part of what we have. But this is, is what he wrote. The poor class are very poorly and the, are almost starved to death. They come in here by thousands to get something to eat, but we could not supply them until a few days ago. Now we give them almost everything they want. They are fast becoming loyal. We have men out there enlisting them that want to join the Federal Army. They have got some 300 now. Women come here after dark and want protection to go home, and some of us boys have to go home with them, and so it goes. We broke into a storehouse the other night. We found everything you could mention. The boys got shirts, coats, vests, sugar, tobacco, knives, and other things. I must close this long letter before you get sick of it, for I have written more than I meant. Please excuse bad spelling and writing. I should like to peek into your cupboard. So good night. And it's funny, he signed it S.H. Bardwell. I don't know who it was to because we don't have the whole thing. But you said, did they really sign their name that way? But I know that we also have a letter that Edward Sanderson wrote home, and he signed it. And he was to his wife, and he signed it E. E. Sanderson. So I guess they did. So in Congress, I'd like to peek into your cupboard. Right. <laughs> I know. Well, I think because they were so hungry, yeah. and their rations were so terrible, it's, it's, just, no, you know. Yeah. They, familiarity and the formality. Yeah. 
sounded a little flirtatious, but I guess yeah. they really were just hungry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, they got a, they had a lot of salted meat, mostly salted pork, and it became very bad. They said it was dirty, and insects got into it, and they had all the hardtack they wanted. And I'm kind of behind on my show here because there's hardtack. That's what yeah. those crackers. They were three inches by three inches. And there was never a shortage of hardtack. And this is the Fort Jackson, the name I forgot it, at Louisiana. And then this is the 10th Regiment, which I kind of kind of neat because they had a dog with them. We did have many people in the 10th, and we'll get to them, or many men, and we'll get to them in a minute. Now, I'm going to read to you what one person said they had in his haversack. He described how much stuff they carried in the haversack. This thing was lined with something that would, would was sort of supposedly waterproof that could be taken out and washed. And they carried their ammunition, their rations, and any other things that they, you know, their tobacco, their sugar, their salt. They were given all these things ahead of time. And they, they had to cook themselves. There was no central cooking. They were they cooked in groups of maybe three or four or maybe as many as ten if they were if they were camped for a long time in a place and the haversack could, could end up being quite heavy. I'm going to show you now. This is something different. In the beginning, they were given a knapsack and a haversack, two different things. As they became more experienced, they began to do what this is called a horseshoe roll. And they took their blanket and rolled it lengthwise and then tied it at the ends. And inside that, they could keep their clothing and anything they didn't need on the march. That actually is a Confederate prisoner, not a Union soldier. But it's the picture I, you always find of a horseshoe roll because it was such a good one. Now we're going to talk about the 10th Regiment. That's the the regiment that had the, that had the dog. The, the <coughs> most interesting story to me about the 10th Regiment, Berea Wilsey, who's at the bottom, wrote a diary that's been published and it's still in print and I was able to buy it. Buell Wilsey was his brother. But there's a Northampton soldier who wrote 200 letters home that have been published and that was available in the library and I got it. So I've read two books about the 10th, and uh, both of these men were Company C, but they never mention each other, which was kind of surprising. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing to me, and this is a story not about battle, it's a story about the Rocky Road of Romance. <laughs> Berea Wilsey, and I have, I have. Berea Wilsey married a woman in Whaley whose name was Luanna Graves. They got married in 1858, and they lived with her parents in the house that Beverly Sanderson owns now that's still there on North Street. They were both 19. It was their first marriage. And this is Berea Milker Meeker Wellesley. He joined up in 61 and went off with the regiment, the 10th Regiment. From the very beginning, from very early on, because of his diary, we know that he was writing letters to and receiving letters from Lucy Goodrich. In 1862, he writes in one sentence, I got a letter from Al, and then there's a blank. It doesn't tell who Al is, but I'm quite sure it's Luanna, because a, one month later, she married again. <laughs> she was still. Eight, 19 years old, although four years had passed. <laughs> uh, she married under her maiden name, and she said it was her first marriage, which it clearly wasn't, because there are actual records. The records are too hard to read for me to put up here, so I just transcribe them. So I went and said, there must be a divorce. And I went to Northampton, I went to Greenfield, went to Northampton twice, wrote to the state never found a divorce and the people who the, I don't know if there ever was a divorce <clears throat> I think that she either regretted a youthful indiscretion or she was annoyed that he was suddenly in love with Lucy Goodrich instead of her and so uh, she married Lorenzo Payne who was from Conway but is buried right here in the Center Cemetery because he went down to 
Baton Rouge and straight away died of fever, which was the end of him. She did, however, have, have, have a child. So this is Lorenzo. The child and uh, Luana lived then, her father had died, as it said on that other slide, but they lived with her mother here in Whiteley. And this is his grave in the, in the center cemetery. Oh, yeah. He's buried in the grave's grave. The 21st Regiment, I don't really have much to say about them, except that one of the men in the regiment was the son of James Monroe Crafts, who wrote the Whiteley history. And the other one, James Waite, in 1879, we have documents here in Whiteley where he was, was taken to court in Greenfield because he went into three barns in Whiteley and stole tobacco, bales of tobacco, in November of 79. He was judged guilty and he moved to New York State. The 27th Regiment really actually didn't do very well. You can see there was a huge number of them captured at Drury's Bluff. <coughs> I, I read a history of the 27th and I saw how many, and it was, a, it was a lot. It was like 30, 40 people were all captured at the same time and all put in Andersonville. But Bartholomew O'Connell is the most interesting one. He was not really a Whiteley person, but he, en he enlisted from Whiteley. His death record's in Deerfield. I, he was married at the time that he went in, but I couldn't find anything more about them. But he was put on a train, to go, taken from Andersonville to go somewhere else, and I think he was being taken to Libby Prison. And he, there were 50 men in a, in a freight car being transferred on this train, and Bartholomew O'Connell took his jackknife and cut a hole in the floor of the train. And when they stopped, for some reason, he, he went out of the hole and into the woods wow. and succeeded in getting away. Wow. He survived that. He'd, he'd survived being wounded before. So he, he was wounded and survived. He was captured, escaped, survived that, and then was killed at the very, at almost a month before the end of the war, was killed at Kingston, North Carolina. The, uh, this, I just put this there just so this poor guy didn't get left out. He was the only one in that regiment. The only thing about the 34th is there was this wonderful picture, which is hard to see blown up like that, but that's the 34th regiment in a camp. And you know, they, they tended to set up a camp sometimes for several months. And they are all gathered, obviously, with their weapons and their tents. They carried a half a tent, and I think this is still true sometimes in, in the Army now, and then two men would get together, each having half of the tent. And in the Civil War, they used their rifles to stand the tent up on, and then they, it was a very small tent, not as big as what they did here when they were in a camp. Here's the 37. This next to the 52nd, the 37th had the most of anybody, and it had the most people killed. Charles Bardwell, I, I'm going to talk about him first, because he was from Whiteley, and he went into the 37th, and when they were in camp, they were also in camp in the beginning. And the commander, the colonel of the regiment, said that whichever company performed the best in their drills would be assigned the honor of being the color guard. And it was Company F, which is what the Whiteley men were in. And Charles Bardwell, they said, a splendid six-footer from Whiteley was given the honor of being the, holding the color guard. And I think I have, yes, this is a picture of these flags are kind of bedraggled. And so far as I could see, the only one that they carried, Company F carried, was the, was this, the United States flag. But they also carried a regimental flag. Somebody said to him that they regretted that he had been given this honor because being the color guard was the most dangerous position. They went first, and the reason for the color guard was so that the regiment could sort of see where they were. It was like the, the people who take you around with an umbrella when they're, you know, touring you around the city. But he said, this is the proudest day of my life, and if I die, I will die for my 
country, and I, you know, I'm, I'm ready. So, so that was him holding the. No, I isn't. This is a, these are random people. Oh. I have, amazingly enough, no pictures of Whiteley soldiers. We have two letters, and 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 not a single picture. I mean, I looked very hard, so we didn't find any. Hmm. At, he, but he was in for two years. They had heavy, they were in every battle all the way through. And at Winchester, he was leaning down, giving water to some, to a wounded comrade, and he took a bullet. And he, he did not die right away. He, he lived for several days. And the minister from Whateley went down to where he was in Virginia and stayed there while he died and came and brought his body back to Whiteley. And his father, this is his father's will, Spencer Bardwell's will, and he said, I give and bequeath to Reverend John Lane the sum of $150 according to the dying request of my son, Lieutenant Charles Bardwell. I'm going to go back to those 37. There isn't too much to say more about them. You can see who died of what in, in this one because they, they really took a lot of hits, either with illness or with bullets. But there was something about this Oliver Vining. The Vinings were a Hatfield family, not a Whateley family. But I'm going to read to you their Whateley connections. Oliver Vining's mother was Orpha, the daughter of Heman Swift, who was from Whateley. His wife, Elizabeth Muzzy, was the daughter of Alan Belden of Whateley. His sister, Sabra Vining, was married to Berea Wilsey's father. His brother, John Vining, was a member of the 37th and died of wounds received at, Curl, at Cold Harbor. His sister, Aletha, was married to or Lauriston Waite of Whitley. And Lauriston was Aletha's, his own wife's cousin because their mothers were sisters. His sister, Caroline, was married to Cullen Vining, who was another Vining. His daughter, Ella Trefino, was married to Richard Abbott, who you won't remember, but was one of those soldiers captured at Dory's Bluff. His his, Oliver's daughter, Martha, married Charles Alvin Bardwell, who was the son of Charles Spencer Bardwell, who was the color guard man who died in Winchester. I couldn't help but put these findings in the Whateley book after I discovered that there were so many Whateley connections with them. just a picture of the wilderness. The wilderness, I, I'm not really talking about battles or, or generals or anybody tonight, but the wilderness was one of the most terrible battles because it was in ground that was very heavily wooded. And it was so wooded that they couldn't use artillery, which they normally use to kind of soften things up before they started their real combat. The Confederates knew the roads and the lay of the land. The Union forces didn't. But the most terrible thing that happened there was that the woods caught fire because the, the trees were so together. And the books say that 200 wounded men who could not be rescued burned mm. to death on the ground there. Mm. And it's one of the, I've never been to the wilderness battlefield, but it is one that I would really like to go to. This is George Washington Bardwell, and he's one of two George Washington Bardwells, which is very confusing to me. But he was in the 36th, not in the 37th. He, was, he lived in Worcester County, and the 36th was raised in Wolf's Worcester County, and he was the only person from Whateley in the Worcester County one. Um, he was, he, uh, I've written here, the regiment was heavily engaged and saw action in many battles and sieges, starting with Fredericksburg in December 1862 and going right through to Appomattox. George, however, did not go home. He was one of 23 men from this regiment, not the, 20, not the 37, killed at, at, in the wilderness. But he was not one of the ones who burned to death because he died, he died four days later in a hospital. 
There was a second George Washington Barnwell, who was also from Whateley. They were fourth cousins. I worked it out. And somewhere in a piece of paper here I have, which I haven't really talked about, but it's written out. There were eight Bardwells in soldiers in Whateley, and all of their, they were of course all related to each other. Three of them were the sons of John Moore Bardwell, who lived up on Dry Hill, and all of those, all of the houses on Dry Hill and Grass Hill are gone, because it all turned into reservoir property. Um, but George Moore Bardwell had three sons go to the war. Only, only George Brown had more. He had four plus a son-in-law, but I'll talk about him in a minute. Um, George, uh, John Moore Bardwell had, had this, had the second George Washington Bardwell. He had Orange Bardwell, who was killed at the wilderness. And he had Dwight Bardwell, who was a member of an artillery, a heavy artillery, and he was the only soldier from Whateley in, in, who was not in an infantry unit. Dwight Bardwell died of illness, not of, not of wounds. The Brown family, which is the, Brown, the family where Hannah Brown married this man from Conway, which is why I took the liberty of including him and bringing his stuff here, he had the one son, Henry Augustus Brown, was actually the most promoted soldier in Whiteley. He started out just as a private, but was promoted and promoted. And I found a very interesting, unusually, they uh, on Fold 3, which is what I used to get all of the information about these men, they didn't include a lot of personal stuff, but with his, they had a copy of a letter that he wrote, and he asked permission to please go, to have leave to go to Quakely, Massachusetts for 10 days. He had received a telegram from his mother saying that his wife was very sick, and could he go, and they did let him go. And so I looked to see what was with her. Her name was Carolyn Belden, Carrie she was called. She had had a baby in 1861, a, a daughter named Jessie, and Henry Brown never saw this child because she was born after he was gone. But she died in January of 63 when she was two years old, and it was then that he asked to go home. So I think that his wife was probably, you know, sick and, and, and uh, laid low because of the death of this child. He also is the person, he had a, a brother named Fred Richard Brown. Fred Richard Brown was the only man in Whateley who was drafted, not enlisted. I'm, I'm not sure why that is. I mean, Whateley had a good record of people joining, being enlisted voluntarily. But Fred Richard was drafted and was, went down and died of diarrhea within a couple short time after he went. Uh, there was a note also in his file saying that his he had no, no will or requests and his belongings were given to his brother, Henry. Then there was a third brother whose name was Francis Carlton Brown who was in an Illinois regiment and a fourth brother whose name was something, James Edward Brown, who was in an Ohio regiment who was in Libby Prison, another one of the southern prisons, but he, he, he got out, he survived Libby grew to be an old man and died in an old soldier's home in, in uh, Milwaukee. Hannah Brown is their sister and married Gordon Johnson, the livery stable man from Conway and the man whose equipment and things are here. So, let's see, what else do I have on here? Oh, this is where Orange and Dwight Bardwell are buried together. One died, and you, this one you can still actually read. This is in West Whaley. Killed at the Battle of the Wilderness, and died at New Bern. He died of either consumption or fever. The 52nd Regiment, is this the one you fixed, I think? This one was a nine-month regiment instead of a three-year regiment. 
and it was the only nine-month regiment that was raised around here. They went right down to the south, down to Baton Rouge. In the nine months that they were there, 10 men in the regiment were killed and 99 died of disease. That's a, it was normally said that two to one died of disease, but that was really 10 to one. And Lorenzo Payne is one of them, the, the, one, the second husband of Luanna Graves. I want to talk a little bit about Lucius Alice because we have Lucius Alice's writing desk up here. And we can, we can open it up and inside it says Lucius Alice, uh, Company C, 31st Regiment. And we've all wondered how could somebody carry a writing desk like this through the war? Well, there are a couple things. First of all, men were allowed a baggage allowance and they could put things on a wagon. Uh, they were given, especially things they were given from home, they had a lot of what in those days were called comfortables, which I think is what we call a comforter now. But they were always writing about they got a comfortable from home, but they couldn't really carry them around. And so they, they, they could put stuff on a baggage cart. But Lucius Alice, I sort of assumed from the beginning, since it said 31st, that he was always with the 31st. But then I began to pay attention to the dates. And I saw that when that regiment was mustered in 61, he was 17 years old. His mother had just died. You could, you could get your father's permission to go if you were older, but not as young as 17. He did not get down there and enlist until two months before Appomattox. He said he was 21. He wasn't. He was 20. He went down to Baton Rouge. He died of typhoid fever just be, two months after the war was over. They, they occupied down there for quite a long time after the war was over. So he was there for such a short time and died so soon that he probably never left camp and that's why he was able to keep this writing desk with him. Um, it obviously is well used. It's nice and light and it's one of the few things that we have here. Um, this poem, which I, you, if you watched Ken Burns, then you saw the woman reading it, but it just broke my heart because so many of those poor boys died young. And then I have this famous, very famous Brady picture of the dead. This is, happens to be at Gettysburg, but I think they had, they, they didn't die in a row like that. I think they were picked up and laid like that so that they could be buried. Now I have, for my last thing, what Edward Sanderson wrote to his wife when he was, when he, he, he wrote a long letter to his wife, which is kind of funny because he, he talked about Reverend Lane. We had the Reverend Lane, how wonderful he was to go down to Virginia, but Edward Sanderson said, I hear that Reverend Lane preached a very affecting service, sermon. If he's so concerned about us, why doesn't he send something nice for us? I'd like to see him practice what he preaches. How can he even call himself a man? And then he talks about some girls that they met. And he said, one of them was very pretty, but I happened to notice she was big as a tub. So I guess someone did more than talk to her. <laughs> This is, this is how he closed his letter to his wife. I shall be glad if this war is ever closed and I can come home all safe and sound and find things all right and my little family safe. I do not know what to think of this war. I sometimes think it will be closed in a little while. Then I think we shall have to stay our three years out. But I mean to get out of it as soon as I can. You may be sure of that. Yeah.